do not wear my sin or shame. They have all been washed away. Gone are the chains of yesterday. I am held in perfect peace. Your covenant is keeping me. You've been all you said you'd be. God are the doubts that I Our theme that has been uh, published on the screen behind me, one universe, one race, one savior, Jesus. Uh, we live in a world that's divided. We live in a world that's divided not only geographically, but uh, ethnically, uh, racially, that all the, the controversy and, uh, and us and them and it is refreshing to read the Bible and know there's one God, one universe, one race, one Savior. Doesn't matter what, what your ethnical, ethnic background is or the language you speak or the tone of your skin or anything else. We are one human family. 
Because one God created one universe and one race of humanity and provided one Savior that is the only opportunity to be saved from all over the world. And I was reading this last week in Psalm 96, uh, which is, I guess, my favorite missionary psalm. And uh, the psalmist declared that we're to uh, share his salvation to all people. And then he linked sharing salvation with all people to the fact that Jehovah God is the God who created the entire universe. Just thinking about that. Salvation is related to creation. God created one universe and it messed up. And he provided one savior to solve the problems. And so our theme focuses on the unity of the universe, the human family, and the solution for sin. It's all wrapped up in Jesus Christ. He's the creator. He's the one who made it all possible. So, so exciting. Our theme verse, I want, you to, I want you to read it with me together. We're going to put it up on the screen. And our theme verse for our missions revival and our missions uh, this year comes from Acts chapter 4. And we're going to read verses 10 to 12. So let's all read it in unison together. Uh, read it slow and with uh, emphasis and meaning. Are you ready? Here we go. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Isn't that a great passage of scripture? No other name. We'll be singing that in each of our services. There is no other name but the name of Jesus Christ. And uh, we're excited to celebrate that here for these next couple of days. And, uh, and learn more and more about what God is doing. Well, one of our missionary families that are here, uh, who is here with us this week is Josh and Allie Miller. Josh and Allie are first-time missionaries uh, heading off to Peru. And uh, such a blessing to have them here. I've just met Josh and Allie for the first time on Friday, uh, although we had spoken on the phone, and he comes with um, uh, high rep good reputation and track record from the places he served, the church that uh, is his sending church. And so it is a Joy to have Josh and Allie come on up and bring us a word of greeting and testimony. And uh, it's so great to have you all here with us. We're excited about your presence this week. And so we're so grateful to be here. We are the Millers. Uh, it's myself and Allie. And we've got our two little girls, Eden and Hosanna. And we will be welcoming a little baby boy in August. Name yet undetermined. So we are looking forward to that. We're grateful for it. Uh, but we are sent out of Vision Baptist Church in Alpharetta, Georgia. Our pastor is Austin Gardner. Uh, just a little bit about the church there. Pastor was a uh, missionary actually in Peru for about 20 years. And so really he has a heart for missions. And that was the whole reason why he wanted to come to the States and start a church was to be able to train missionaries, to be able to train people uh, to go and serve on the mission field. And, and really he's done that. He's sent out about 40 families from our church. And we got about 60 families with the mission there. Uh, but it's been a tremendous blessing to us to be able to serve under him, to be able to learn from him. And he's taught us so much, not only about missions and about serving in ministry, but also about family, uh, about being a, a, the husband, about being the parents that, that God's called us to be. And so we're very thankful for, uh, for the opportunity we've had to, to grow up there and, and all of that. Uh, and so really, it was actually our pastor's son uh, who introduced us to Peru. Uh, we were able to take our first uh, mission trip, internship there in Peru, and spend some time there, and God really blessed there and showed us the great need in the country there. I was excited this morning to be able to share a little bit with the, with the class that was up there uh, about how God called us to Peru, how, he, how he's opened up the doors and how he's led us there and, and really given us all the opportunities in the world to, to serve and to train and to grow. And so we're very thankful for that. Uh, but really, while we were there on our trip, that's where God burdened us for the country of Peru, uh, where he burdened us for missions. And I, I mentioned this morning how while we were there, uh, the idea was we, we knew that God wanted us to, in missions, uh, but we didn't want to put a pin in the map and say, this is exactly the location right now. And so as we came back from that trip and came back to the States and began to train, uh, we just wanted to have open hearts 
open minds and say, Lord, we're willing to serve you anywhere you would have us. Uh, but we really had a desire and a burden for Peru, and the Lord continued to open up those doors. Uh, but in Romans chapter 10, this is a passage of Scripture that's really spoke to me, uh, and I, re- I believe is a real good description of the people of Peru. Uh, this is Paul writing about the, the, the Jewish people and the people that he, he loves, the people that he comes from. And, and his, in verse number 1, it says, His heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. He has a passion and a desire to see people saved. Uh, He loves these people with everything inside of him, and he just wants them to know the freedom that he's found in Christ. And in verse number two, it says, I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And this is what we saw there. We saw people who were extremely devoted, uh, extremely religious, that would go to great lengths to, uh, to, to serve God, to try to please God with their actions. But, but at the end of the day, as it says here in this passage, they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. It says that they're being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness. And I shared this morning in that class how uh, my father grew up Amish. And so he had this exact same background where, where he grew up trying to, to please the Lord with his actions, trying to please the Lord with his works, and kept spinning his wheels year after year trying to please God, not realizing that Christ had come and made a, a substitute for him, that Christ had come and made a payment on his behalf. And so it broke our hearts to see people all, all over this world and there in Peru that are extremely zealous, extremely devoted, extremely dedicated, but also deceived. They don't have an understanding of the gospel. Uh, But really, at the end of the day, it leaves them empty and hopeless. Uh, There's a lot of people there. There's a lot of issues with with drugs and alcohol and alcoholism. And and one man that we met while we were there, his name was Juan. And if I could take you to Peru and introduce you to anybody, I would introduce you to Juan. Now, there are a lot of people in Peru named Juan. Uh, but this man, he shared with us his story about how he would go out on Saturday nights and, and he would get so drunk that he couldn't even find his way back home. And so he, what he would do is he would end up passing out alongside the road on his way home. But there was a missionary who had started a church there in his town. And so when he would go out on Saturday nights, he'd do his normal thing. And as he would be passing back through, he would actually pass out right in front of this church. And so as that missionary would come in on Sunday morning, he'd be getting everything prepared. He'd come in the back. He'd get the, ch- the chairs straightened up, get everything ready to go. And, and he'd go to open up the front door. And here was Juan laying drunk in front of his church. And so if you can imagine, put yourself in his position. He was, he was telling the Lord, listen, I've been praying for visitors. And this is my visitor. This is who came to see me today. But he looked at him as he saw him as someone who God loved and who Christ died for. Not a nuisance, not a pain. And so he would help him. Every week he would share the gospel with him and he would help him back home. And week after week, Juan continued to come back to church. Not, not to come to the service, but to pass out in front of the church. Uh, see, he, he knew that if he, if he wound up there, he would get home safe. So week after week, Juan got to hear the gospel. And so one day as that, uh, that missionary was preaching in the morning service, the, the, the back doors of the church opened up and here came Juan walking down the center of the aisle. And in the middle of his message, Juan put up his hand and said, could you just be quiet for a minute? he said, listen, you've been telling me week after week how I'm a sinner, how I'm far from God, how I need to be saved. And I can understand that. He said, I know I haven't been living a righteous life. I know that I've been uh, doing wrong, and I know that that God's not pleased with that. But he said, you you also told me about grace. You also told me that when Jesus came and he died on the cross, he he didn't just do that for for sin. He did that for me. He did that so that I could have a relationship with him. And he said, I want to trust Christ today. And so that day, right then and there, Juan trusted Christ. He didn't understand the order of service, right? You wait until the invitation at the end of the service, you can come forward. He was excited about the gospel. He was excited about what Jesus did for for Juan. And so his life was changed, and and people in the community, they began to take notice of that. They began to see that his life wasn't the same. It It was almost like he was a new creature, right? He was completely different. And so week after week, families began to come, and they'd bring their children, and they'd find that missionary. They'd say, listen, I don't know what you did to Juan, but can you change my kids too? They said, you worked some sort of miracle with him. I need, I need you to do that in my family. And he began to tell them how, listen, I'm not the one who changed him, but I can tell them about the one who did. I can tell them about Jesus. And so families began to come and their lives began to be changed because of the work that God did in that one man's life. And if you'd go and you'd visit Lighthouse Baptist Church today, you'd see that Juan is now pastoring and preaching in that very same church that he used to pass out drunk in front of. That's a testimony to our God. 
and to the grace of our God who uses people just like Juan, just like me, and just like you to do his work. And we are so thankful and privileged that we get to serve God in the country of Peru because we believe that it's the gospel that changes lives. It's not about us. It's not about what we are going to do. We just want to be faithful messengers to share the message that's changed our lives. And in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul tells about how he's not ashamed of the gospel. He's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because why? Because it's the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is the power of God. And so we can't wait to go and share with them the radical message that's changed our lives and that can change theirs as well. And so we truly believe if we're faithful to go and to share that message with the people of Peru, that people will be saved, uh, people will be trained up for the ministry, and churches will be started all over Peru. Because it's not about us and our power and our strength. It's about the Lord and what he wants to do there. And so if you would, please pray for us. I, I truly believe, I've, I've seen uh, so many things around here that indicate to me that you are a church that loves missions, that loves missionaries, and I do believe that you will pray for us. What I would ask you to do is to consider visiting us. Consider sending your young people to us. Consider taking a trip to come and, and see the ministry. And I, I just want to be a testimony to you that says that taking a missions trip, taking time out of your schedule and going to visit the field to see what God's doing, can change your life. It can change your perspective. It can change your goals. It can change everything about you. If you'll just take a step out and go visit a mission field, it'll, it'll, it'll give you a new heart uh, for the missionaries that you support and the missionaries that you serve with. And so please pray for us. Consider coming and visiting with us. And so right now we are uh, set out. Our goal is to leave in January. Uh, that's our, our goal departure date. And so if you would, please uh, pray for us to that end. Uh, and one of the, the biggest needs that we have right now is just getting everything together for, uh, to be able to set up there on the field. And so getting a house together and, and appliances and all those different things. And so thank you so much for the opportunity to be here, to be able to share our heart with you. And we, we are so thankful for your church and your prayers uh, and everything that you've given to us so far. Amen. I have known Bradley Edmondson for many, many, many years. And uh, he has served uh, alongside Betty's brother in Ashland, Ohio, Calvary Baptist. And, uh, and then I have followed from a distance his ministry as it's grown and blossomed to an amazing organization that God is using to impact missionaries and missions churches uh, around the world uh, through bringing medical missions to them and uh, building relationships with communities and villages. And God has so richly blessed uh, Bradley Edmondson and his family in the work that they, uh, God has called them to do. So it's my privilege, and it's a great opportunity for us as a church family to enjoy hearing from Bradley Edmondson this morning, tonight, tomorrow night, and Tuesday night. Well, good morning. It's good to see y'all this morning. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Um, I mean it that uh, I love your pastor. Your church has just a rich testimony for missionaries all over the world for your love, uh, your generosity, your encouragement. Uh, I do bring greetings from Honduras. Missionary Matt Goins was so excited that I was going to be here with y'all this week, and he was jealous. He said he wanted to be here with me. Uh, he appreciates y'all and just your love that you have for his ministry there as well. And uh, I have been looking forward to this for quite some time. Your pastor's organized. Y'all know that, right? Uh, y'all know how organized he is. Your pastor called me and asked me if I would come and be a part of this conference in 2019. He didn't know about coronavirus. Uh, I didn't know where I would even be, but I appreciated that. My ministry, we, we work about three or four years in advance. We're working for countries that we're going to be entering in in 2025 already. Uh, we're trying to prepare for those teams and those trips. And so for him to call me that far in advance was awesome because I could actually make sure I was going to be in the country. And then it just gave me an opportunity to build the excitement all this time to be here and to be a part of this conference and to get to meet each and every one of y'all. And I tell you what, your, your testimony has been spot on. Thank you so much for your hospitality. Thank you so much for your kindness that you've already shown to me and to our family. Uh, my wife was devastated that she couldn't be here with us. Uh, she wanted to be here. Our kids wanted to be here. Uh, a surprise that happened in between 2019 and today, uh, being able to be at your conference, God decided to move our family and our ministry, a relocation that just happened two weeks ago. We moved from Baltimore, Maryland down to Atlanta, Georgia. It was basically that last snowstorm. I just couldn't take it anymore. 
anymore. I put it all into a U-Haul, and I said, I'm out of here. I can't take it anymore. Uh, but we did. We just recently transitioned to the Atlanta area, and as a result of that, just my wife needing to get our house put together and to get our kids into school and everything, uh, they unfortunately could not be with us. And so she sent me messages even this morning. She's praying for us and that she wanted just to send her greetings and her love to your church. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Ruth chapter 2. Ruth chapter 2 this morning. We've been talking an awful lot about the fields, mission fields, going out and serving. We've been hearing about Argentina and what God is doing there, about uh, all that's going on in Washington. We know through your church and other churches like yours in this area and a new church that's going to be planted. We're hearing about Peru and all the great things that are going to happen there and what God is already at work uh, and doing there. Um, I had somebody ask me for the first time a few weeks ago. I had not been asked this question in a really long time. It was a couple that we had just met. We were kind of getting to know them over dinner. And she looked at me, uh, the wife did, and she said, have you always known that you wanted to be a medical missionary? I said, no, absolutely not. Uh, that is not at all what I was intending to do with my life. And she said, well, when you were young, what did you want to do? And I kind of was a little bit sheepish because I didn't know how they would feel about my answer. But I told her the honest truth. I wanted to be a farmer. I grew up in rural Alabama, and I did. I wanted to be a farmer my whole life. I wanted to raise cattle. I wanted to have chickens. I wanted to have big farmland, tractors, the whole nine yards. I mean, that's what I really wanted to do. And when people would ask me that growing up, I grew up in a youth group that was all about being in full-time ministry, and I would get really nervous about answering. But that's what I wanted to do. Uh, as you know, God obviously changed my life. Uh, God allowed me to find out that there's a different type of field he wanted me to work in. Um, I wish I had time. I won't take the time this morning to, to dive into my whole personal testimony. Maybe throughout the week I'll get a chance to tell you a little bits and pieces here and there. Uh, but when I met my wife, we both had a burden for missions, but we didn't know what it looked like, exactly what we were going to do. And the fact that I'm actually a medical missionary, the fact that I get to stand here this morning and represent medical missions outreach is a miracle in and of itself. How the ministry came about is a miracle. And what we are seeing God do on a regular basis is absolutely miraculous. But this is my field, and I love what I get to do. I love what God has called me to be a part of. I want to share with you the thought process about your field and what God is calling you to do. I believe with all my heart that if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you have a personal relationship with Him, every single person in this room this morning has a field that you should be serving in. You have an area of ministry. You have a unique skill set. You have a qualification. You have a personality. You have friendships and abilities to reach people that I never will. God has equipped you to reach your community, to reach your world, to reach your field with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Ruth chapter 2 is where we're going to start, and I love this passage of Scripture. In fact, when I speak anywhere for the first time, I always preach out of this passage because I love it. This is one of those things that God uses this passage on a regular basis to encourage me, to, to keep me uh, excited about what He's done in my life and what He's continuing to do. So let's go down to verse number 4, and we'll start here, and it says this, And behold... Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, uh, The Lord bless thee. And then said Boaz unto his servants that was set over the reapers, um, Whose damsel is this? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered said, uh, It's the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And, and she said, I, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, uh, hearest thou not, my daughter? Uh, go not to glean in another field. Uh, neither go from hence, but abide here, fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. H have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go into the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. And then she fell on her face and, and bowed herself to the crown and said unto him, Why? Oh, why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother in the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Amen. I love that Boaz comes home, 
And he's the owner of the field. He goes out and he's, he's kind of looking to see what's going on today. Who's all here? How's the workers doing? And as he's scanning the field, he sees this woman. You, you kind of read it with me here as we were looking at this passage of Scripture in verse number 5. Whenever he's looking out over the reapers, he sees this woman out there. And I'm going to translate this how we would say it in Alabama. The way he said this was, good gracious, who's that good looking woman out yonder? That's what he says there. Who's this damsel that's out there? I have never seen her. Who is she and what's she doing here? And the guys all that worked there, they said, Boaz, you know her. She's the Moabitish woman. You remember uh, Naomi's uh, daughter-in-law. She's the one that came. You remember her story, right? You remember how she was married. Uh, she had met a young man whose family had left their country. They were in another country. And she met this man. And I'm not sure if it was an arranged marriage. We don't know all the details of exactly how this all played out. But we know that she married a man from a different country with a different culture, with a different religion, probably spoke a different language. All kind of interesting things there when you really stop and think about the background of how this all happened. She's married to this man, and somewhere along the way in their early marriage life, uh, tragedy strikes. Uh, excuse me. Tragedy really strikes here. Uh, tragedy strikes by her father-in-law. He passes away. Not only her father-in-law, but her brother-in-law passes away, and her husband passes away. This is a male-dominated society she lives in. Now they have no men in their life to fend for them. They have no men to protect them. They have no men to provide for them. She is now struck with this tragedy. Her mother-in-law comes to her and says, listen, I'm devastated. I'm brokenhearted. I'm absolutely just bitter, to be honest with you, that God has done this to me. And I'm going back to my people. I'm going back to where I came from. You go back to your people. Go start over again, girls. Y'all are young. Go get remarried. Go do whatever. But I'm going back brokenhearted. The sister-in-law, she does. She goes back to her people. She leaves. But Ruth, she makes this huge important decision. Uh, she looks at her mother-in-law and she says, no, 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 listen, I've seen something different about your family. I, I've seen something different about the God that you worship. I, I, I see something that's a, a different testimony than anything I've ever experienced in my life. And where you go, I want to go. Uh, your people, they're going to be my people. And then this huge important phrase, she says, and your God is going to be my God. Uh, the, the testimony that you have, Naomi, you may think that God has dealt bitterly with you, but God has done miraculous things, and I want that same God to be the God of my life. And so here we find her going back to this male-dominated society. We find her in this field about to start work. We find her in, in, in God's way of providing for the underprivileged, for, for the people that need in their life. We find her in this field getting ready to go out and work when all of a sudden the owner of the field comes. He sees her, and he calls her, and he says, Listen, Ruth, I want to bless you. I want to bless you more than you've ever been blessed in your life. I want to provide for you like you were not expecting today. When you showed up, you were not expecting this, but I want to do something for you to absolutely help be a blessing to you. And he begins to tell her exactly what he's going to do. And you also read with me later in that passage how in verse number 10, she falls down on her face and she's like, I can't believe this. Why in the world do you want to bless me? Why in the world do you want to do this to me? Uh, who, why would you do this? I'm just a stranger. And he says, because I know, Ruth, I know who you are and I know whose you are. Ruth, I know the decision you made. I know how you decided to trust God, how you've come here faithfully trusting for God to supply. And that's exactly what he's going to do. He's using this opportunity to provide for you. But this is how it's going to happen, Ruth. If you want to see the provision, if you want to see the blessings, if you want to see God's greatness on display in your life, this is how it's going to happen. And he enters into, I hope I don't mess up the legal terms here, a kind of a, a quid pro quo, a, a prid quo, prid quid pro quo with Ruth here when he says, listen, this is kind of a this for that. If you'll do this, I'm going to provide that for you. And here's where we find our message today that I hope will be an encouragement to you. Go, if you will, to verse number nine. I love this. Ruth, here's how the blessings are going to be poured out in your life. Here's how you're going to see me at work in your life. Here's how you're going to see all that you need to be provided for you. Verse number nine, he says this. Look at the verse part. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap. Okay, Ruth, here's the deal. You want to get the provisions that you need today? Uh, you want to see blessings in your life? Ruth, you came here expecting something, and it's going to be even greater than you had have ever imagined. This is the first part that you've got to get solidified. Your eyes need to be right here on this field. And Ruth, listen, I want you to make sure that as you're out here, you are focused on this field. Have you ever had one of those moments in your life where you say, God, why are you so good to me? I have. I was sitting in Ouagadougou, Burkina Faso, everybody's favorite vacation spot, right? Uh, West Africa. 
Uh, I was sitting in a pharmacy when a lady walked in the door with one of our medical providers, and they said, Bradley, we, we need to do something. We need to help. And this woman handed me her baby. Her baby's name was Fataz. Fataz was about six months old, and he weighed about four and a half pounds. She hands me this baby, and when I looked at that baby, um, I'm telling you, I, I almost lost it. The baby was starving to death. His skin was stretched so taut around his skull, you could see the growth plates. I, I was watching this baby as he was trying to cry. He was so dehydrated, he couldn't even produce tears. His skin was so tight around his, his, his jawbone and his cheekbones. My heart was absolutely shattering, and, and she's expecting a miracle to take place right now. This is a baby on the brink of death. As I looked up at mom to try to start to talk to her, I realized mom was starving to death too. Mom was in just as serious a condition. She begins telling me how she was married to a Muslim man. She was one of three wives that he had. He had passed away and left all of them destitute in a country where pretty much everyone is fending for themselves. Everybody is living day to day, hand to mouth, trying to just get what they can to provide for themselves on a daily basis. And she's come to us and she's expecting a miracle. And my heart was beginning to break and I didn't want her to see me cry. And I said, can you give me just one minute? And I took baby Fataz and I walked to the room next to me and I just started crying. Because I'm sitting here saying, God, I got four, you saw the picture of my kids, I got four fat little piglets sitting at home, and we got a pantry full of food, we got, we got a refrigerator full of food, and you've been so good to me. God, you gave me parents who love me, parents who raised me in a Christian home. God, over and over and over in my life, you've been so good to me. God, why me? Why did you choose to be good to me? And in that moment, I realized that the reason why God has been good to me is because who I am and whose I am. I'm his child. I chose to be a part of his family. And he's been good to me, not so that I can collect for myself, not so that I can heap it all to me and have my own kingdoms and my own treasures, but so that I can put off on the plate of other people and do the best I can to help other people. Boaz, why have you been good to me, Ruth? I'm good to you because I want you to be blessed by this, but I want you to help your mother-in-law and I want you to help other people. You're going to be blessed because you've made decisions to be here in this moment right now, but you've got to be focused. Every single one of you, I hope you understand God has been good to you. God has blessed you. God has provided for you in miraculous ways, and I hope you never lose sight of that, that he has equipped you, he has blessed you in, in immeasurable ways, but it's not so that you can keep it to yourself. It's so that you can get back into your field and produce for other people to know the goodness of God too. Amen. Ruth, listen, I'm going to be good to you, but I want you to be focused on this field. Notice what he says to her. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap. Ruth, listen, it's this field right here. This one is for you. Don't worry about what's going on in the soybeans over here. That one's not for you. Hey, hey don't worry about the, the cornfield over here. What they're doing over there, that one does not concern you at all. The cotton field back there, none of them. None of these things concern you. This one right here is for you, Ruth, and I want you to be focused on this field and this field only. What we need today in churches is for each and every one of us to be focused on the field that God has called us to. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, every once in a while, I get on Twitter, and I have followed a bunch of different people in ministry, and if I'm honest with you, I get frustrated with it. Because it's like a lot of fighting over who's doing what in other ministries and what they do and don't like about them and, and how they just got to pick at other people. I'm tired of that. I don't need that. I, I don't need Facebook where it's going to have one church member fighting with another church member over stupid stuff. Listen, if we would all be focused on the field God has called us to and reaching the people in our community and reaching the lost around us, we would see our churches doing miraculous things today. We need to be focused. And I love how he tells her this. I love how Paul puts it in Colossians 3, verse 23. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. Be focused and do it all for God. Do it for his glory. Galatians 6, verse 9. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. But ye, brethren, according to 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 13, be not weary in well-doing. Be focused. So listen, can I encourage you this morning? If you're part of the choir ministry, be focused and give it everything you've got. If you're part of that kids ministry, I hope you get up early. I hope you study. I hope you pray for those children and you invest every single thing you can possibly do in those kids' lives so that they will grow up and have a godly ambition to serve God. If it's reaching your neighbors, if it's reaching your coworker, if it's that, that family member that's lost without Christ, if it's anybody at your workplace, be focused on reaching people for Jesus Christ. You have a field. It may be that single mother that's the barista at the coffee shop you stop at all the time that's 
struggling, that needs to hear you bless her, that needs to have that track given to her, who needs to hear that she's invited and will be welcomed at this church. It may be that person that's strung out on different types of addictions that you see on the street corners begging for money. It could be anybody that passes you. If that is your field, then be focused and get to work. I believe we're, we're, we're on borrowed time here. The Lord's coming back any time now. Amen. He's coming back, and we need to be found focused, serving where God has called us to. My field is medical missions, and I'm going to do my best to reach it for the cause of Christ. I love your pastor, and I love his focus that he is called to be right here in this community of South Riding and reach every single person he can. I love the fact that the Millers know that they're called to Peru, and that's where they're passionate about going, and they want to get there. That the Downs are going to go right over here to, to D.C. as well, and they're going to plant a church, and they're going to reach more people. That the Merlots are going to Argentina. We, each one of us, should be able to raise our hand and testify, I know where I'm called, I know what I'm called to do, and I'm going to reach it with all of my might for Jesus Christ, because I'm passionate. Passionately, Amen. passionately focused on what God's called me to do. But he doesn't stop there. Ruth, listen, here's the deal. Uh, I, I need you to be focused on this field. Don't look anywhere else. This is it. Everything you need, all that you would find in life is, is going to be right here for you. I'm going to give you everything you need. Just please stay here in this field. But he doesn't stop there because he keeps on going. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap and go thou after them. Okay, so this is the, uh, the part that's a little bit tougher here. Ruth, I want you to be focused, but Ruth, I want you to be following. You do realize he's the owner of the field, right? Uh, he could have just yelled out, hey, fellas, hey, hey, guys, everybody that's out there, do me a favor. All y'all come over here for just a minute. Bring your bags with you. Bring everything that you've been harvesting. Bring it all with you. He could have walked over there and said, okay, now listen, I want all of y'all just to dip out of your bag and give some to Ruth. He could have done that, couldn't he? He owns a place. He could have obviously done that, but that's not what he chose to do. Just like our Heavenly Father could cause the rocks to cry out, just like He could cause angels to descend and tell everybody the gospel message, He could have chosen a myriad of ways, but He has chosen you and I. He has gifted us with this opportunity. He has blessed us with the, with the, 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 the immeasurable responsibility of going out and telling people the gospel message. This is what He's chosen, and He's called us to not only be focused, but to be following what He wants us to do. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where we're going to have to get down and act actually do the work. This is more than just saying, I know I'm called to be a Sunday school teacher. I know I'm called to be a youth worker. This is where it's more than I know I'm called to be a deacon. This is where it actually comes to a place where I'm saying, okay, but I'm actually going to put the work into it. We have a lot of people that love to have titles. We have very few people that actually want to do the work of the ministry, that I will actually study, that I will actually pray that I will actually put myself out there and invest in people. That neighbor whose home seems to be breaking apart, that I, I hear that they're having some marital issues, and, and I know it may not be any of my business, but I love them in the Lord, and I just want to try to bless them and encourage them, and I want to try to have them over for dinner, and I'm going to try to put myself out there and reach them. Uh, that person that you know of that struggles with that addiction, they feel like they're going to find love in another arm and another set of arms and another set of arms, or they feel like they're going to find completion if they can just put something else into their body one more time. They can dull the pain. You say, listen, I'm going to put myself out there. I'm going to actually put the work into reaching them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the part where it's the actual following. Ruth, get out there. And I'm going to tell you, it's going to be hot. Listen, Ruth, I know you're dressed in the, in the modern day garb. You've got the long robes on and, and you're going to have to get out there with your bag and you're going to have to walk along. You're going to stoop down, pick up and put it in there. You're going to reach down, pick up, put it in there over and over. And that bag's going to get heavier and it's going to get heavier and it's going to get heavier. But Ruth, every time you take that step, every time you pick it up, every time you put it in there, every single time you're receiving the blessings, you're putting in the work because this is what I want to do in your life. I'm going to tell you, it's not always easy. Listen, I'm not going to sit here and play my sad violin. I don't want anybody feeling sorry for me. I love what I'm called to do. But it's not always easy. Waking up somewhere else in the world, not knowing where I'm at, it's happened many times. I've sat up in bed. I had no clue what country I was in. Where was I? I had to stop for a minute and think about where am I. I was 36 hours away from my family when my daughter had an accident with a knife and she accidentally stabbed herself in the eye. Let me tell you, that will bring you to a reality in a heartbeat of what God's called you to do and make you wonder, God, is this really where I'm supposed to be right now? 
I can tell you story after story that it's not been easy, but at the same time I've watched God provide and God protect and God do everything just like he said he would if I just go in my field and I serve him the way I'm supposed to. And he's been good every single step of the way. What I'm asking you this morning is to step out there and go to work. To, to make sure that you're ready, that you're, you're in a position where you can serve him. I love how David puts it in Psalm 63, verse 8. My soul followeth hard after thee, thy right hand upholdeth me. Uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 are my life verses. Trust the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not into thine own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. I love how 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 through 18, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perisheth, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but on the things which are not seen. For the things which are not seen are, temp or are, seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. It's all about what God is doing and the glory he's going to receive. I can get out there and go to work. Ruth, listen, I'm sure we could sit here and argue all day long about different ways it could be done, different methodologies, all those things. But really what I'm asking you to do is go out there in this field and go to work. We need you. This church needs you to step up, to do your part, to go out into your field to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Ruth, here's the deal. If you will be focused and you'll follow this plan. I mean, listen, you got to be passionate. And you've got to pursue what I'm giving you right here in this moment. If you'll do all of this, here's what you can expect from me, Ruth. Here's the blessings that you can guarantee. These are guaranteed. I'm, I'm telling you right now, there, this is not one of those things that are optional. It's going to happen. Here's what you can expect from me. Look at what he continues to say in verse number 9. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Listen to this part. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? We can read over this and gloss over this in a heartbeat because this is not our culture. We don't understand the depths of what he's saying right here. Again, this is a male-dominated society. Uh, this is, again, a woman who's not bringing a profit to the owner of the field. Uh, this is something that God had instituted. This was almost tradition in this community that you had to let the poor people come out there. You had to let them come and pick up the stuff that had been left behind. That was God's plan. But it wasn't always something that was readily accepted by the wealthy people. And so it was, it was a very common thing for, for the gleaners to be coming out there. And as the workers were working, if they got a little bit too close to raise a hand to them, you better step back. This is not your field. To push them, to get them out of the way. But the owner of the field just looks at Ruth and he says, Ruth, if you'll do all these things, here's what you can expect from me. First thing you can expect from me is there will be protection. I'll protect you, Ruth. I've already told the young men, they better not touch you. Uh, they, better not, they better not look at you sideways, Ruth, because I'm telling you, I'm the owner of the field and I've given you permission to be here to do this. What's holding you back, seriously? Uh, what's holding you back from reaching that neighbor? Uh, why are you so shy about offering the gospel to a lost loved one in your family? Why is it that you've heard the stories around the water cooler uh, about one of your coworkers that is in so much pain? Uh, they've been going through so much in their life and you can tell they are lost and they need a savior. What is keeping you from reaching them with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are you scared about something? Are you scared about getting involved in the missions program and offering some type of grace giving uh, to the missions giving of this church? Are, are you scared about maybe going on a visitation program and, and reaching someone that you've never met before? Are you scared about joining in and committing yourself to serving in some fashion here at the church? Let me tell you this right now. When you follow God's plan for your life, when you serve in the field that he has for you, you can guarantee you have the protection of God watching over you. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. It's of, the mercy, it's of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed, because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in Him. The Lord is good unto all that wait for Him, to the soul that seeketh after Him, according to Lamentations 3, 21 through 25. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16, uh, 6 says this, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. There is an absolutely fine balance of faith and common sense and having faith and following what God has called me to do, 
He's given me a spirit, not of fear, but to follow him. Each time before I leave the field, um, if you saw the picture of my family, my oldest son's name is Noah. Noah is 14 years old. And again, not trying to sound like I'm being super spiritual, anything like that. I'm just being realistic. I'm going to be transparent, tell you a little bit more about my household. Before I leave the country, I usually pull Noah aside. Uh, his middle name is Moises. My kids all call me Poppy. And so I'll tell them, I'll say, Moises, listen, Poppy's headed out of country again. You're the man of the house. You're the man of the house. Take care of mom. My wife just had her third back surgery in a year. Uh, she's had some, some health issues with that. And I'll tell them, you're, you're the head of the house. You take care of mom. You keep the other three sweat hogs in line. You make sure that they're obeying, that they're doing their chores, that they're doing right. You, you help me out there. And I usually will tell him this. And listen, if Poppy doesn't come home from this trip, it's okay. I'm not guaranteed tomorrow, just like you're not. I go into some environments where it's not welcome to have Christians in the community. I've been in West Africa across the street from mosques where we got that, that side look every time the, the prayer would end, the call to prayer would end, and all of the folks would be leaving the mosque and they would come straight to our clinic because they wanted medical care. I know what it was like to have the imam staring us down, wondering why we were doing it, and I had no clue what would happen. I'm not guaranteed of tomorrow. And I would tell him, listen, no, if I don't come home, it's okay. I'm doing exactly what God's called me to do. God will bless. God will provide. It will be okay because, listen, I am guaranteed of this. No matter what they do to this body, they can't touch my soul. Amen. And I'm okay with that. I am absolutely 100% at peace with that. I've learned that if he calls on me to give up something, he's usually going to replace it with something better. So why hang on to that money? Why hang on to that possession? Why hang on to that pride? Why hang on to whatever it may be that's holding me back? Give it all away to God and watch what he can do. Ruth, listen, I promise you I'm going to protect you. Just get out there and go to town. Go out there and get the blessings that are waiting for you. Go see joy and fulfillment like you've never experienced before. This is your field. Go after it. I guarantee you, Ruth, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to keep you safe. But he doesn't end there. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Go into the vessels and drink. Ruth, listen, I know it's hot out here. I know you're going to get tired. I know that when you get out there and you're bending over and you're grabbing all this stuff and it's going to be a long day here in the Middle East and you're just going to be sweating and you're going to be tired and it's a lot of work. But whenever you're ready, whenever you need it, because you're going to need it, Ruth, there's water already prepared for you. That's what he says. Go and drink of the vessels which young men have drawn. It's already there. It's waiting for you. I will supply everything that you need. Isn't that amazing? That he knows my need before I even know it. He's already got it prepared before the time comes that I know that I'm going to need it. And all I've got to do is trust God for it. It's available for me. Um, Speaking of protection, we were in Haiti right after the earthquake, and we had a team of 28 there, orthopedic surgeons. We were doing round-the-clock surgeries in a hospital there in Quade Bouquet. And as we were working and uh, we continued to see more and more patients, the military found us and they started choppering in patients. They started bringing us patients and uh, medic hummers and all of this kind of stuff. And I mean, we were overrun with patients, so much so that we stepped outside of the hospital walls there to start triaging the patients to find out the needs, the severity of the needs that they had. And as we were out there working, suddenly about four mopeds came driving up and these guys were wearing uh, NBA jerseys and they all had gold chains on. I called them Hades Angels. They came riding up on their little mopeds there, and they began to just stare us down. I had two guys from Homeland Security that were with us that were our security. They had weapons, and they were wearing scrubs, so they kind of fit in, and one of them came to me. He said, Bradley, we're being cased right now. We're about to be robbed. I said, by these guys? I said, yeah. He goes, there's no doubt. He said, he said, these guys are here. This is about to be trouble. I said, all right, give me a second. Let me help get these other people inside the clinic. So I went over to our team. I said, hey, listen, we're going to take a break. Everybody go inside for a minute, get you some water. We're going to take a break. Leave your stuff out here. Me and these fellows will watch it. We'll, we'll, we'll get back started in just a minute. Just go ahead right now. Everybody go ahead and go inside. As I'm doing that, I notice that the guy from the security, he's over there right in their face taking pictures of them. And he's going, I just want to remember what you look like. I'm glad you're here today. And he's taking each one of their pictures. And all of a sudden I heard this noise. It was really loud. 
And there is, uh, you'd have to imagine this building with big, tall brick walls around it, concrete walls, probably about 12 foot high. Uh, it was streets on all four sides. And you could see on the back wall dust just coming up over the walls. And all of a sudden around the side walls, there's dust coming. And all of a sudden around the corner comes three big Hummers. And the doors open and these guys pop out of there and they come walking over and this guy goes, I'm Sergeant so-and-so from the 82nd Airborne Division of the U.S. Army and I'm on a peacekeeping mission from NATO. Who's in charge here? I said, well, I am. He said, uh, I came to check on you. I said, well, your timing is perfect. He said, are you worried about these guys right here? I said, actually, we were. Our security detail just said that we should be concerned. He goes, I know, we've been tracking them and we heard they just came this way. I'm here for them too. I said, well, praise the Lord. <laughs> and he went over and he used some terminology that I will let the army use. I won't use it in a church setting. And next thing you know, those guys got on their mopeds. They drove away. We never saw them again. In 16 years, that's about as close as I've gotten anything happening to me. I'm sorry to disappoint y'all. But God's been good. He protects. He provides. Uh, I, I would love to take the time to tell you a story of how God provided financially time and time again miracles of, of people who have stepped in when they had no clue we had a need and provided. I, I would love to sit here and tell you about how children and, and patients have come into our clinic with dire needs and, and life-threatening situations that we, we usually would have no reason to carry this medication or we would usually have no reason to have this type of specialist on a team, but God provided the way he always does miraculously. So y'all this morning, seriously, what's keeping you out of your field? I'm begging you, please, let's get real for just a moment and think about it. Why are you so scared to get involved? Why are you, why are you standing on the periphery? Why are you allowing people to die and spend a, a, an eternity in a literal physical place called hell? Why are you not involved with bringing people into the kingdom of Jesus Christ when he has equipped you? He's told you he's going to provide for you. He's done everything on his side. He's just waiting on you to say, God, I know this is my field and I'll do it. I'll surrender. God, if this is who you want me to reach, I'll reach them. God, if this is where you want me to serve, I'll serve you. Can I finish with one last thing and then I'll be done? And, and I won't even take the time. Matthew chapter 6, you go home, read Matthew 6, verses 25 through 34. And you read how God will supply all of your needs. But can I end by sharing with you one last verse that encourages me every time? It's found in verse number 23. At the end of this chapter... After we look at this, this, this quid pro quo that's taking place and, and we see that Ruth agrees to it and she steps out there, she puts herself out there and she goes to work. Look at verse number 23. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean. I love these, last, these next three words. Unto the end. Unto the end of barley harvest and of wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. She kept fast unto the end. Last thing I want to encourage you with there's probably some folks out here that say, Bradley, I know I used to be involved. Bradley, I know I used to be more passionate. Bradley, I, I, I got burned here or there or somebody mistreated me or, or I didn't agree with something that I saw and I used to, but I don't anymore. Can I please take just a moment and encourage you to get back at it? Stay faithful to the end. Stay in your field that God has called you to, to the very end, and watch what an incredible harvest he's going to provide in your life. God wants to use every single one of us this morning to reach somebody, some people, somewhere with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it really needs to be every single one of us. No matter how old you are, you can be in the fourth quarter of your life, you can be in the second quarter of your life, it doesn't matter. God wants to use you right here where you are to reach people for Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining us for part of a Sunday service at Community Baptist Church. I hope to meet you soon. May God impress His love upon your heart this week.